Good morning on the West Coast. Good afternoon on the East Coast where I am. I'm in Orlando. This is the Cone Zone. That's Lowell Cone. I'm Grant Cone. The NFL annual meeting is done. John Lynch spoke. Kyle Shanahan spoke. Jed York spoke. I was there. Let's talk about it. The big news was Brandon Ayuk. He's the, the player the Niners need to extend. They're having a bit of salary cap issues, which is why they had to cut Eric Armstead, and they got a lot of questions about what's going on with Brandon Ayuk. How did you interpret their various answers? Okay. The way I interpret the 49ers is they're not sure what's going to happen, that they would prefer, their preference would be to keep Ayuk because he's a hell of a player, mm -hmm. but they're not sure they can work it out, and they may have to deal him. Is that how you read it? Yes. Absolutely. Okay. Um, it's a shame that they're in this position because Ayuk is their best wide receiver and he's one of the best wide receivers in the league. So, we, I mean, that's obvious, all of that. But I'd like to talk a little about how this negotiation is going on. Ayuk, from immediately after the Super Bowl till now, has been um, – writing snarky things on X. And I think he's been on various other platforms. Instagram, talking. yeah. All that stuff that I don't understand. And it's sort of he's been taking shots at, at the Niners and essentially saying money talks and all of the... All, he posted right, that right after John Lynch spoke uh, yesterday so talking about how much the Niners wanted to bring him back. And what did he say? Ayuk? Yeah, he 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 he, he wrote money talks bullshit walks. Really? Yes. Okay, money talks bullshit walks. Okay, so here's what I have to say. And then, um, the Niners have been saying, you know, we'd really like to have him, but we don't know if we really can, and all of that. This is the first time I've seen the Niners negotiate through the media. Mm -hmm. Usually, John Lynch, um, John Lynch is a gentleman. And John Lynch usually says, you know, this is private. I, I, I'm confident we can work it out. Let's move on. Mm -hmm. Now he's answering, mm -hmm. um, saying, well, we don't know. When he does that, he's trying to put pressure on Ayuk. That's, I mean, it, let's be honest what's going on. It also means he's telling Ayuk through reporters. Yeah. That would lead us to perhaps believe he's not really talking to Ayuk. Or I right, he's, he's doing indirect communication instead of direct communication. Right. That yeah. things are, are really tricky there. And he's going through you, Matty Mayoko, et cetera, to get the message over to Ayuk because he can't get the message directly to Ayuk. Now, from Ayuk's point of view, he's probably feeling uh, that he's really terrific, which he is. He's really valuable, and he wants to be paid accordingly. There are ways to handle it. One would be to allow your representative to talk to the 49ers, which is Nick how Rosa did last year. Yeah, you keep your mouth shut. That's why yeah. you, you pay an agent. Right. But he's taking it into his own hands. Right. And he's doing things that are rude, rude to the Niners, not rude mm -hmm. to the media, not rude to fans. Like sneering but, at them. Absolutely. Sneering at them. Mm -hmm. And here's what I have to say about it. We've seen it before. Debo Samuel did the same thing. And it's what a young man does. Right. you got to remember, um, Ayuk is 26. Iggy, you're 36, and I still consider you young and learning. He's 10 years younger than you. Yeah. And he's acting in what I would call a um, childish, high school way, uh, mm -hmm. thinking that if he throws a bit of a, fit, a hissy fit, and he um, lets people know how angry he is that he'll get his way. It's like a child. I'll hold my breath until I, until I get my way. I don't appreciate what he's doing. I don't. The Niners gave him a chance. They've, made, they've helped him emerge as a star. I think a grown-up gentleman would find better ways to do it. And as a side thing, you know, I'm 78 now. I retired when I was 70 or 71. One of the things I realized when I retired that I wouldn't miss, every year I was getting older. I did it for almost 40 years. But the players weren't. 
they were always in a sort of an age group. And I, when I was a younger man, I could talk to Chili Davis, Jeffrey Leonard, Will Clark, Joe Montana, because we were relative contemporaries. When I was in my 50s and 60s, I wouldn't have had anything to say to Brandon Ayuk. Nothing against Brandon Ayuk. I wouldn't have anything to say to anybody his age, except how's your hamstring? What were we going to talk about? Yes. Okay. <clears throat> so he's being a little immature and unprofessional, but I think the main takeaway here isn't his comportment. It's the fact that the Niners seem a little nervous that they're not, they may not be able to work this out with Brandon Ayuk, and he seems to be uh, dug in. And I know Debo Samuel seemed dug in for a while, too. He, re he requested a trade, but it feels like the Niners kind of knew they were going to win that negotiate negotiation with Debo. He had one good year. There wasn't a big market for him. He wasn't really even a, a wide receiver. He was a combination player that they could use. But Brandon Ayuk is a wide receiver who's been consistent, and I think it's pretty clear what he's worth. And the Niners are kind of acting like, yeah, I mean, they're saying all the right things about him. He's this, he's that, he's this, he's that. But you wonder if they just can't afford to make the offer that he would get on the open market. And if that's the case, maybe Brandon Ayuk has a stronger position than Debo Samuel had and uh, will use his leverage. And get traded? Get traded, hold out. I mean... He could hurt himself by holding out. He could hurt the Niners too. What if he misses a month of the season? How many games would the Niners win? Maybe they'd win him. Yeah. Yeah. It's awkward. I, I, would I would have to say, in terms of money owed theoretically to Ayuk, the Niners put themselves in that position. Mm -hmm. Ayuk didn't put them in that position. Mm -hmm. Ayuk is only asking for what he, what he believes the market will bear. And he doesn't owe anything to the 49ers. It's business. They know that. Um, my gut feeling, Iggy, he'll be on the team next season. Sure. What do you Jed think? York, Jed York said today, if there were no salary cap, this would have been done already, which makes it seem like there's momentum or there's desire on both sides to make it happen. But it also makes it seem like if it doesn't happen, they have their built-in excuse. Like, you know, we just couldn't fit them in our salary cap. And they seem to be having a tough time fitting players into their salary cap this offseason. That's why they cut Eric Armstead. He was a cap casualty. And the people they've signed so far have been one, two-year deals that are not that expensive. So I don't know what they think. I don't understand their finances that well. Maybe they'll just trade him and say, look, we tried, but he just wasn't cutting us any breaks, and we couldn't afford it. Iggy, do you think he'll be on the team next season? I think they're going to find a way to give him what he wants. I do. I don't think he's going to, I mean, I don't know how the negotiation is going to go. Maybe we'll never find out, but I don't think he's going to move too far for the 49ers. I think his value is pretty locked in. I think other teams would give it to him on the open market. I think the Niners want to um, keep him and they might make it hard, hard for him the next few months, but I think they'll ultimately give him what he wants, just like they gave Nick Bosa what he wants. And, and Debo. Yes. And Debo. Yeah. yeah. So they have, they have a, history the team of appearing to be hard but finally working out the details because these really are accounting details yep they can they can you know there are other players they can get rid of or they can restructure or things like that so yeah. these are not desire issues the desire is that they would like to keep them uh -huh. it's an accounting issue and my guess right. is they can find the money in a way in a way by eliminating money elsewhere yeah, they've been doing some very creative accounting the last few years. Of course, they got in trouble for it uh, recently, lost a fifth-round pick, but it seems like they're at the cutting edge of accounting techniques. They're aggressive, so I would agree. Um, they'll figure it out. Right. The, it's, it's true. I forgot about that. They have been very creative, apparently, in, uh, in accounting, and maybe they can do it in a kosher way. Yeah, apparently what they did was they overpaid a player and they tried to get the money back without telling the league and the league was said, you can't do that. Oh, okay, I didn't know that. Right. $75,000. So that's what's really going on with Brandon Ayuk. Do you think, would you ask me if Brandon Ayuk's going to be on the team next year? I think yes. You think yeah, yes? Yeah, me too. Yeah. yeah. Do you think he'll, I, I also wouldn't be surprised though if he tr holds out of all of training camp the way Nick Bosa did last year. 
Okay. Um, he could. I got to tell you, I don't think his position is as strong as Bosa's. He was an offensive was. player of the year. It's right. true. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, and Bosa, look, let's, you like Bosa. You it, find him very easy to deal with. Yeah. Bosa n never said a bad thing about the org. He never said a word. No. He was word. completely professional. Yeah. And I would say. Unbothered. He, unbothered. I have yeah. an agent. He'll handle it. I'll train with my brother or wherever I'm training. And when it's time, I'll come to camp. No one resented him. Everybody understands people want to make money. No, no one resented it. And there was no residual bad feeling between him and the team. Here's another reason I think Ayuk's going to be on the team this year. The Niners build through their defense, and it's and in a lot of ways it's a defensive team, but they're quite okay making big changes on their defense year after year. New coordinators, new players. They swapped out half the starting lineup this year. Offense is Kyle's baby, and I think he likes keeping it together. I think he likes it the way it is. And you saw he brought back Colton McKivitz. He re-signed John Feliciano. I think he really wants to have the same exact offense on the field this year that he had last year because he thinks it's great and getting better. And Ayuk would be a key uh, part of, of that offense. Again, at one point a, f a few years ago, I thought that Debo Samuel was the most um, impressive offensive weapon in the league, not counting quarterbacks. I no longer feel that way about Debo Samuel. I, I think he's declined, and I think the offense uh, has or should move away from him a little. I think Brandon Ayuk is so gifted, he can take that emphasis. Yeah, Debo Samuel got paid so much money because he was this hybrid player who could play multiple positions. Um, but now it seems like he's a player who doesn't play either position, particularly at an elite level. He's not an elite running back. He's not an elite wide receiver. Right. But he's paid a lot of money, whereas Ayuk is an elite wide receiver. See, that's where they should go. They should go to uh, Debo and ask him to restructure. Yeah, they asked Eric Armstead to restructure because he's overpaid and doesn't play enough. Isn't that Debo Samuel? Yeah, they should yeah. ask him to restructure. I wonder why they asked Eric and not Debo. I wonder if Eric thought of that. I don't know. You know, I I I don't know. I don't know what went on with Eric Armstrong at Armstead. Iggy, what team did he go to? Jacksonville. Okay, G good. G uh, yeah. God love you. All right, let's check in with our sponsor, BetUS, and check in the uh, Coach of the Year odds. Jim Harbaugh is the odds-on favorite. Are you surprised? W what is this? Uh, Coach what's of the year this odds. here? Coach oh, of the Coach Year of the odds. Okay, Coach yeah. of the Year. Start yeah. again. And Jim Harbaugh. Jim is Harbaugh the is the overwhelming favorite, plus seven hundred, to win this. I can see it. Uh, may I make a case for Harbaugh? Sure. One, he he won the national championship in football, and that's hard mm -hmm. to do. Mm -hmm. And then he got out at the right time. We saw him over here. He is a hell of a coach, and he can turn around a team instantly. He can do it, and he has the quarterback to do it. I'd say he's a hell of a head coach. And I think the, the, the Chargers are an instant team to be considered. Where I never, when Staley had him, I, I, I never, you know, you had a, a, like a guy with rigor mortis on the sideline uh, wandering up and down. Now you'll have a really alive dynamic coach. So I can see that. Yeah. The Niners got Brandon Staley. He's, he's going to really help them. Yeah. They, they, they had rigor though. mortis, rigor mortis up in the, in the booth. I don't want to. I, I want to place a wager, and I don't want to bet on Jim Harbaugh because he's the favorite. I don't like the action there. What okay. about Robert Sala plus sixteen hundred? Can I make the Let's case? Let's do it. I, please do. Robert Sala. So la he's gone seven and ten two years in a row with some of the quarterbacks that no other team in the league would want to play. He had the number three defense in the league last year. If Aaron Rodgers can like not blow out something immediately, that team might exceed expectations. Because I don't think they have very many expectations anymore. I love it. I, All right, I'm putting 10 bucks down on him. You spoke to him the other day at the meetings. Did I he did seem speak. normal, confident, uh, uh, happy? Absolutely. He seemed like the same Robert Saul I've always known. He, he does seem like um, being in New York has taken a toll a little bit. He was, he was commenting like, you know, Kyle doesn't understand. He's got like 10 people who cover him every day. I got 25 Coming to ask me questions every day. 
I, yeah. <laughs> that, that sounds tough. Anyway, thank you. <laughs> Hold on. Let me, let me just run the uh, commercial. Bet US, America's favorite sports book and casino. Live betting and race book. We're celebrating 30 years with a historic offer. A 125% sign-up bonus on your first three deposits. Plus 10% gambler's insurance. Get started today. Bet US, where the game begins. Okay, before wow, we move that, on. I that was impressive. Wait a minute. Oh, wait a minute. That was serious impressive. Stuff. Serious the guy's stuff. voice That's and everything. Right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's how we do. Yesterday, I mentioned on my show with Ryan that I was going to be going to this reception at the NFL annual meeting and that I was prepared to maybe have a drink with Kyle Shanahan and shoot the breeze. Uh, didn't see Kyle Shanahan there. I was there for three and a half hours. Saw Robert Sala. Talked to him for a while. Saw a lot of coaches. Saw Jed York. Saw, saw John Lynch. Steve Young. Troy Aikman. Vince Carter, Charles Wood, like a lot of people were there. But um, it seemed like Kyle never showed. And I also didn't see Matt LaFleur, Sean McVay. So it's possible those three buddies were off doing their own thing. I don't know, but I was disappointed. So why were you disappointed? Because I was prepared to talk to him. And I wanted to uh, see what he would say to me. And see what kind of relationship we might have in a non press conference setting. Sure. But I guess I'll have yeah. to wait until next year. Uh, let me ask you some questions, Iggy. Mm -hmm. uh, was, it, was Andy Reid there? I did not see Andy Reid. Okay. Was mm -hmm. Mike Tomlin there? Yes. Okay. Um, so I heard uh, Mike Tomlin went up to a writer and was like, uh, How mad would you be if I made a trade right now? <laughs> and he would like, pull out his phone and be like, "How do you spell Ayuk? How do you spell Ayuk? A Y I Y." Oh, that, that is so cute. Yeah, that is so, so cute. It seemed like Mike Tomlin has a good time with the people who cover that team. I heard that the Steelers still let all of the beat writers watch practice, all of practice. They're old school. Now it's like twenty degrees when you're watching practice, but you can watch it in Pittsburgh if you want. Also, John Harbaugh was out there the entire for hours talking to. Reporter after reporter after reporter. It's like, okay, this guy, you can see how he's been a head coach for 15 years. Like everyone knows him and loves him. Was his little brother there? I didn't see Jim. I saw John a million times. Apparently someone saw John, uh, Jim and he was walking around pretending to be on his phone. You ever see people do that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He's yeah. On his phone. Yeah. So that's funny. not a networker. Yeah, not a network. Okay, that was last night. A little, little bit of a, dead, a letdown, but oh well, there's next year. Jed York spoke today. Jed York made news. He bought out his mother as principal owner of the 49ers. It's always a special moment when a billionaire becomes a little bit more powerful. I really, I mean, it, it warms your heart. It's so relatable. Dad, where were you when you finally bought out your mom as the principal owner of the NFL <laughs> franchise? It's, it's, it's part of, you know, coming of age. So Jed did it, and we're all impressed. Uh, do you think anything will change now that he is the principal owner of the 49ers? Okay, this is a really good question. First of all, I thought he was the principal owner. <laughs> when the news broke that he bought out his mother, I said, oh, I thought he was the principal owner. So I guess I was mis mistaken all these years. Um, I, I would say a couple of things. I couldn't care less. <laughs> So he bought out his mother, you know, still his mother, you know, say, uh -huh. go sit, sit in the corner, whatever. Um, the other thing is, my guess is nothing's going to change because he's been making most of the decisions for a long time. Now, it's possible his mother and his dad were holding him back or holding him a little accountable. And now they won't be able to as much. I think he has a big ego. All the people you deal with down there have big egos, Iggy. And it's possible that his ego will run amok. But my guess, my gut feeling is no, that yeah. you won't notice any difference. What do you think? Yeah, when the news broke yesterday, my initial reaction was, oh, maybe we'll get, you know, um, young Jed back. Because when Jed was younger, he really wanted to be like Eddie DeBartolo. He fired all kind of people. He fired freaking Jim Harbaugh. And then famously said, we don't, we don't raise NFC Championship banners like he had high. It was just, young Jed was something else. Um, and then 
I kind of assumed that maybe his parents stepped in after like the fifth fire and they're like, all right, Jed, <laughs> we're going to do this together and we're not going to fire him after one year. So I, I wondered if it was like they're holding him back and there's part of Jed that like wants to fire Kyle Shanahan and be like his uncle. But I don't think I think he's outgrown that. I think he <laughs> embarrassed himself trying to be like his uncle and realized that's not going to happen. And I think he's really grateful to have the stability or whatever they've whatever they think they've uh, achieved with the 49ers. They've achieved pretty much everything you can other than the ultimate goal. Really, other I mean, than really achieving. Yeah. Um, he's not going to fire Kyle Shanahan. N- not anytime soon. No. It's, I, I almost feel like Kyle has a lifetime contract over there. He's like yeah. Tomlin over in Pittsburgh. You know what I mean? He yes. can do no wrong. Mm-hmm. So no, I, I, I don't, I don't, really anticipate let me say anything really different but if there is i'd really like to know what it is maybe he'll talk more jed yeah i don't think you need him to talk more or i mean he always put often puts his foot in his mouth so that's newsworthy that's what i'm saying they the team doesn't need him to talk more i don't i'm not i don't mind (laughs) okay so he spoke just about an hour ago, a couple hours ago. And uh, Ryan Hensley yesterday said, Grant, if you get Jed York, please ask him about the thing he said 10 years ago where that was right after he fired Jim Harboys. You know, we don't raise NFC championship banners around here. We raise Super Bowl banners. And if we d- fail to deliver that, I expect you to hold me directly responsible and accountable. He said that 10 years ago. And then a few months ago, he said, you know, the season would have been a success even if we had lost the NFC Championship. So Ryan asked me to ask Jed, which I did, can you explain your your shift in in, in thinking? And to Jed's credit, he went, he dove right in. He said, absolutely. You know, I I realized that it's, it's, it's nothing to be ashamed of when you have a successful season. I think that was a direct quote. And he went on and on and on to explain about how there's nothing to be ashamed of when you finish second and that it just means you got to keep working and that sure, Eddie DeBartolo got really upset when he wouldn't win at all, but Eddie didn't have a salary cap except for 1994 when he won Super Bowl with a salary cap. But most of the time he didn't have a salary cap and he had the best quarterback in the league and he had all these advantages that Jed can't have. And given the, the, the constraints that hold Jed back from being great, you know, really, they're doing every everything and more that you could expect them from. And it's really proud. And so what he's saying is, even if you come in second, if you gave it a great effort, that's a good thing. Right. Right. Because he's they right. came in second, but they lost to Patrick Mahomes, who's the best quarterback. So really, the Niners are number one. They're the best organization in football. They just keep losing to the best quarterback because that position is so important. But really... They're the best organization in football. So what I have to say very clearly, if you accept being second, you'll always be second. That's what I think. If in your framework you say second is good, then you'll be second. I kind of like this. Yeah, I kind of like it. Uh, It's You know, it would be nice to be first, but not everybody can be first. So. Well, we'll take second, then mm-hmm. you'll be second. If yep. you said we'll take third, then you'll be third. Be third. You're, yeah. you're predicting where you're going to be. Yeah. Um, can you imagine Vince Lombardi saying second is okay? Uh, he His brains would have come out of his ears. The, the, what you're supposed to do in football is win the Super Bowl. Right. That's what it's about. Mm-hmm. You're supposed to win the Super Bowl. And what he should have said, as opposed to I accept being second, was, you know what? Until we're first and win the Super Bowl, we're unfinished business. We're here to win the Super Bowl. We believe we can. We've come up short. We don't want to come up short. We're going to win it next season. That's a lot stronger statement than saying, yeah, you know, I've grown. I've matured. I'm a, I live in California now. And it's about feelings. Yeah. It's about my feelings. And my feelings are, I don't want my feelings hurt if we come in second. I'm still a nice man. It's still a good thing. Baloney. Come in first. Aim for first. Accept yeah. nothing else. Yeah, it's like he tried to frame it as wisdom. 
Like, yeah, well, as a young man, you're a black and white thinker. You don't really understand. But as you get older, you realize, really, I mean, why should you be upset when you were almost the best team in the league? Yeah. Uh, Bill Walsh would have been upset. Eddie would have been upset. Eddie would have been upset. Eddie would have missed Eddie would have made changes. It's a Eddie missed opportunity. Made, yeah. 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 And there's nothing else but yeah. winning. Yeah. Right. And now you've lost the Super Bowl three times, Jed. Three. And it is it is like a self-fulfilling prophecy. It's good enough for you. And yeah. that's your limit. And we're supposed to empathize with him. That he's learned wisdom. That right. in life there's more than yeah. coming in first. Maybe in your personal life. Not, not, not on a football field. Now your business is doing well. But that's not what fans or no. I care about. I don't care about your business. I care about how good are you? And it's like, what has he learned the last 10 years? Has he learned how to win a championship? No. What he's learned is how to rationalize not winning a championship. <laughs> I love it. Right? That's beautiful. He's like 10 yeah, years ago, it. you know, like when I first lost the Super Bowl, it really hurt. But now I've lost three of them. And I understand I could lose more. And it's not the end of the world. We keep making money. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> like now I'm in my mid-40s and I understand we there's profits, there's all kind of stuff. And you know, if we happen to win, like all he's learned about a Super Bowl is that maybe if they keep plugging away and doing what they're doing, maybe they'll win one eventually. But they, he has no more insight in what it takes. All of his insight is how his uncle won him, all the advantages they had in the 80s, all the disadvantages they have now, all the things that are out of his control. Like, he could give you excuses for days. But when it's time to be, all right, Kyle, I mean, Jed, what do you know about winning a championship that you didn't know back then? Nothing. No, he learns it's not as important as it was yeah. then. Yeah, yeah, I make a lot of money. I have a good life. Yeah, and now and I'm running kind of, the show. Now I'm running the show. Right. Right. Now I just got promoted. And he frames it like people who are so focused on the bottom line are like a lower form of life. Like, oh, you haven't really evolved a homo sapien yet, have you? So <laughs> <laughs> you would say that without your opposable thumbs, huh? Oh, geez. <laughs> Yaz Williams says, sounds like they are ready to pay Brock next year. Yeah, that's another thing Jed said. It's like, there's going to be a negotiation. And Jez basically said, yeah, we're almost certainly going to be paying Brock Purdy a crazy amount of money. Well, good. You just made John Lynch's job a lot easier. Also, hold on. Uh, let's be real clear. Brock Purdy mm -hmm. is a lot more important to that team than Brandon Ayuk. True. Yeah. Caesar says, Kyle, please pay attention to any possible rule changes while at this. <laughs> Take notes. Bring index cards. Bring index cards. We're counting on you. Bring a little recorder. Wow. These jokes won't go away. Anoop says, are we still allowed to ask questions about Super Bowl 58? Sure. Why didn't Kyle call screen passes to offset five, six, and seven-man blitzes on every pivotal third down? Because he's a genius. Anoop, haven't you figured it out? This team is the best team in the NFL Minus the ones that have won championships. All the, all those, the Niners are the next one. I think they oh, deserve no. something. Good. I disagree. They're better than the teams who have won it's championships. True. It's true. No, no, yeah. you got it wrong. Yeah. They didn't win championships, but they're better. Yeah. If you really know football, like middle brow people judge teams based on the championship right? Real low IQ people. But if you're smart and you know the sport, you understand that it's the team that's winning in the second half of the Super Bowl, and then what happens at the end doesn't really matter. That's right. Right. Yeah. I mean, Jorgen1990 says he called successful a season without a Lombardi mentality is in the bin. Dad, can you imagine if Al Davis were alive and he could react to what Jed York said? What do you mean success? What are you talking about? You got to dominate. You got to dominate. You got to dominate. Remember when uh, was it Tom Cable was the head coach yeah. and he finished eight and eight and someone asked him, how do you feel about finishing eight and eight? And he said, great. You know, we uh, we're not losers. I think Al fired him that week. Like, what are you talking yeah. about? Yeah, we're not losers. Yes, we we're are. Not losers. He said we're not anymore. losers anymore. 
Yeah. Not losers anymore. First of all, I'm not a loser. Second of all, you're a loser, eight and eight, buddy. <laughs> yes, Williamson's Super Bowl loss was a clerical error. Absolutely. It was a clerical error. Clerical error. Okay, let's talk. Kyle. Kyle Shanahan spoke this morning very early in the morning. It's I mean, it's tough. Eastern time zone. We're both West Coast guys. So getting up that early is it's not easy, but he was there. What time? he answered a lot of questions. Huh? What time did he what time did he show up? He was I it was supposed to be there at 745. I'll give him 753. Let's call it eight. Five o'clock in the morning. It. Five o'clock in the morning here in Oakland. Yeah. So he was a little late, but you know, he made it. Okay. And I asked him, why were you so focused on defense and free agency? And he said, you know, we had all those free agents there. We needed to get new players. You did have free agents on offense, but you brought those guys back, but okay. And then someone asked him about the offensive line, like. Why do you keep bringing all the guys back? And he's like, well, I mean, it's a really good offensive line. And the more they're together, the better they're going to get. And Colton Kivitz in particular is a really good right tackle and is exactly the kind of guy they want, uh, which was, he said it so casually. Um, what'd you think? Well, Iggy, how good was the offensive line against Kansas City's blitzes in the Super Bowl? I mean, if not blocking people were the goal, they were great. <laughs> I mean, I think it's uni it's it's a, a a a truth universally accepted that that line did not do that well. McKivitz seems like a very nice man, and he tries very hard. I think there are better right tackles in the league, and I think uh, didn't didn't he give up a certain amount of sacks? Let me get to, let me get the numbers real quick. Uh, according to Sys Data Hub, you guys can check it out yourself. It's free. I'm looking at um, pass blocking leaderboard from 2023 uh, sacks total. Ikem Ekwanu, left tackle from the Panthers, gave up 15. Makai Becton, left tackle for the Jets, gave up 14. And Colton McKivitz, right tackle for the Niners, gave up 13. So he gave up third most sacks in the league last year. Yeah. So when when Kyle tells you he's really happy with McKivitz and his offensive line it's it's he's blowing smoke yeah how could he be how could he be happy with the third most sacks in the league so it what it tells you is one he doesn't value the offensive line two he doesn't value protecting the quarterback and three he never learns no. he doesn't learn no I want to say something else Iggy he said he wanted to keep continuity on the defense. That's why most of the stuff they've done so far, now the draft is going to come, but they're going to be rookies. Most of the stuff has been defense. That would imply to me that the offense is just hunky-dory. The offense oh, is yeah. great. I mean, the, yeah. problem was over, the problem was over there. It's not on my side of the ball. Uh, our offense is great. Well, is it? I mean, in, in the Super Bowl, you know, the game that matters to most, but apparently doesn't matter to the 49ers because they just want to get there. Um, they only scored 19 points in the first uh, in regulation time. Right. That's not a lot no. for for someone who's supposed to be the standard, Kyle. Uh, OK. In a lineup that needs no changes, no changes, no and changes. It's getting older. Yeah. And needs no changes. I'll yeah. tell you right now, Bill Walsh would be changing a lot of things, not only on defense, but on offense. He'd be making changes. I'll tell you. And what I'll tell you is this. He'd get rid of Debo. He'd get yeah. rid of the, of the uh, fullback. Uh -huh. um, he'd either get rid of Ayuk or make sure that he stayed, but he'd get more wide, wide receivers. And boy, would he improve that offensive line. He yeah. would have done all kind of things that Kyle – I'm going to say this has a blind spot for. Yeah. He thought the defense needed help. I'm not saying it doesn't, but so does the offense. And if he doesn't understand it, he's in Allison Wonderland. I don't understand how an offensive tackle who gives up 13 sacks and 17 games is the kind of guy you're looking for. Like, uh, just put the imagine if he faced the same DN every week and now. That was that DN's numbers for the season. 13 sacks. You'd give that guy like twenty five million dollars. Yeah. He'd be one of the best players in the league. Like Colton McKivitz turns these guys into the best players in the league. No, he's not good enough. Are you kidding me? He said both in the run game and the pass game. In the pass game, he gives up sacks like one a game. And in the run game, 
Everyone that watches the Niners know that when they run successfully, which way do they go, Dad? Left. Le- everyone knows that. What is he talking about? I don't know what he's talking about. You know what? He seems to be a guy who's self-deluded. He says what he he says what he wants to believe, not what's real. Does he believe the things that he wants to believe? I I I actually think he does. That's a problem. If you can <laughs> yeah. convince yourself, if you can lie to yourself and convince yourself that you're telling the truth, that's a big problem. The existential philosophers would say he's in bad faith. He's in bad John faith. Paul Sartre would say he's in bad faith. He's lying to himself. So that means he's uh Malfoy. Mauvais, uh, mauvais foi. Yeah, Malfoy. Same thing. That means bad faith. Malfoy. You got to call him Draco from now on. <laughs> Draco. Got to call him Draco from now on. Sorry. Uh, okay. One more Shanahan topic. Okay, I want to do it. This has nothing to do. I'll set it up real quick. This has nothing to do with the owners' meetings, the NFL annual meeting. This was a uh, an article in the Athletic that came out right before the Super Bowl. Okay. So I, I would like to handle this one because um, for personal reasons. A couple of weeks ago, um, a writer who I didn't know uh, needed some help on something. And I always try to help writers because when I was starting out, writers helped me. And it's what we owe each other. And it was about an hour interview on the phone, a very nice man. And when we were done, he thanked me for my time. And he said, what do you think about the fact that Kyle Shanahan has bugged uh, 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 coaches' meetings with the players, has microphones in in the room and uh, uh, cameras. And I said, boy, I I don't know what you're talking about. Uh, I've never heard of this. He said, ask your son. He'll know. Mm -hmm. So I got off the phone and I called Iggy. I said, the craziest thing, Iggy, I was just talking to this man, and he said, the um that Kyle bugs uh, coaches meetings and Iggy said it's true dad I said really he said oh the athletic did a whole article about it during the Super Bowl I said well I don't read the athletic um so I don't have a subscription I don't read much sports anymore but the athletic was generous and let me read one article for free and I read that article And so what I'm saying is, this is not conjecture on my part. This is not a theory. This is true. Um, Kyle Shanahan snoops from his office. He can turn on a camera and a microphone in coaches' meetings. So let's say the defensive line coaches' meeting. He can listen in. Let's say the uh, wide receivers are in a meeting with a coach. He can listen in. I object to this, but I want to say something in advance. I'm not a fan. I'm a journalist. I I s- try to see this on its merits and demerits. Most people watching right now are fans, and the the tropism that fans have is to agree with management and to back up management. So a lot of you right now are trying to find reasons why it's okay while what Kyle is doing. And years ago, when Ira Miller and I used to talk about fans, he said, whatever the uh, organization does, the fans will support. And um, that that's just how life goes. So I understand. Right now, you're trying to argue against me. I love it. Fair. I'm just going to have my say, and, and you see what you think about it. And if you write comments, just please be polite. I'll tell you what I don't like about it. Let's say... I, I have a job in an, in an office, an insurance office, and I have my little cubicle and I'm, you know, doing whatever I do, selling insurance over the phone or, or that. And I know that there's a camera and a microphone in my little cubicle so that the boss can tune in whenever he or she wants and snoop on me. Mm-hmm. Well, first of all, it's going to degrade my performance because yep. I'm going to be nervous. I'm not going to want it. I'm not going to be able to do the right thing or perform at my best. Second of all, I'll feel sp- that I have a spy on me, mm-hmm. that someone is spying on me. What if I want to pick my nose? 
Well, what, what, whatever people do when they're alone, yeah. and and I'd feel intruded upon in a way I never have felt in my life and don't want to feel in my life. Okay, I was that's thinking cre- about that's this. a creepy feeling. Oh, it's disgusting. It's, a it's nineteen feeling. 1984, where, mm. where everybody gets spied upon by Big Brother, George mm. Orwell's 1984. But I wasn't sure, so I called a, a retired coach who I know. And I told him what I had heard, no, what I had read. And he said, I don't read The Athletic. This is news to me, Lowell. I said, what is your response to this? He says, I hate it. He said, when I was a coach, I was hired because the head coach had confidence in me. He had vetted me. He had confidence. And I would consider it a smack in my face if he had to snoop on my meetings. He should have confidence in me. And he said, what's more, the players are a team, but the coaches are a team too. We have pride. We try hard. It's a smack at the team of the coaches that that Shanahan thinks he needs to do this. It's degrading. And Iggy, that's what I feel. I feel even more, what kind of a person would do that, would want to be so controlling. Uh, I, if I were a good assistant coach and I had options, I were offered a job at the Niners, but I had options to go other places that were good, I wouldn't go to the Niners. I would yeah. go to a place where I had freedom of activity and where I wouldn't have to worry that someone was listening in, especially because – in a meeting, you want to build up trust between the position coach and the players. Maybe sometimes you want to say something bad about the head coach. Right. Now, in the article. And as a head coach, it, you want your, your players and your uh, position coaches to be confident enough to be able to say something like that. Of course. Yeah. In the article, in fairness, in the article did point out that Shanahan has, has left his coaches the option to turn off the apparatus if something personal comes up. And that's nice of him in the context of doing something not nice. How often can a coach turn it off? Yeah. I mean, really. How about for the whole, every time, how about the whole time, every day? Yeah, you can't do it. You no. could do it maybe two times, but if he did it and a he'd lot. He'd ask you about it, right? Why, why'd you turn it off? Why, why'd you turn it off? I mean, you know, you know I, need, I need to hear what's going on. I, I need to make yeah. corrections. So there is the option, but it's almost an illusion. Right. So... What I get the well, you don't have to come to OTAs if you don't want to make the team. You know, <laughs> you don't yeah. have to leave your camera on if you don't want to coach here anymore. Right. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. yeah. So, um, what I feel is it leads to a lack of morale, a lack of trust, a lack of honesty, um, and it feels like you're almost a slave. Yep. You're almost a slave. And I have to say, this is not a football issue. This is an issue of morals, ethics, ethics. Um, and relationship dynamics. And relationship dynamics. Your relationship dynamic. with your coaches, your relationship with your players. In each case, his relationship dynamic is w- controlling on his part, which is not healthy. Right. And also in the in the meeting, the players could think, why should I listen to my position coach? Because the head coach may storm in any minute and say yep. he's full of crap. Yep. So I, I, I think it's better what you're saying, relational dynamics. I would not want to work in a place like that. And I would I if Kyle, well, if because Kyle is the kind of person who does that, I don't think I'd like to really be his friend. No. And, you know. He's always had the wrong quarterback. He finally seems like he has the right quarterback in Brock Purdy, and Brock Purdy does everything right. But at a certain point, Kyle is going to have to give up control and empower Brock. And I don't know if Kyle has it in him. Andy Reid gave up control and has empowered Patrick Mahomes to the point where Patrick Mahomes, if he wants to call a play, Andy Reid will say, great, because that means that the best player in the league is bought in. But Kyle, I don't know if he'll ever get there because the best call is Kyle's call. And if he's not, if he doesn't have his hands on the steering wheel, he freaks out. Yes, he freaks out. It's control. I, you know, I got it. But I'm just talking about microphones and cameras. And here's what I don't like about it. 
I want to come back to human behavior. Yeah. It's sneaky. It's yeah. sneaky. It's right. not above board. Iggy, right. when you were growing up in this house, I didn't have a microphone in your room. No. Because you don't really know where the microphones are. You don't know how many there are. Are there right. microphones in the locker room? Where are the microphones? How hey, many? listen, Iggy, yeah. are there microphones in the press room? I would have to assume they are. I mean, I don't know that don't they know. are, but why would I think that there aren't? If he does it elsewhere, why wouldn't right. he do it in the press room so he could hear what people are saying about him? I right. don't know. Uh, yeah. I'm not, you have to I'm, assume I'm, that he is. Otherwise, you could get in trouble. You have to act as if there is. You, 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 you can't probably can't say what you want to say about him in there no. because if he does it in other rooms, it's possible. I'm not saying even likely. It's possible he's it's doing it there. So you have, you have to act as if as if he's doing it there. Well, now all of a sudden it feels more like a concentration camp than a football outfit. Yeah. I don't like it. I no. don't like people to act that way. I like people to be upfront. And I like people to give you the benefit of the doubt once they've hired you. And I like people, in this case, men, to be gentlemen. That's how I feel. And so I want to say this, Kyle, I'm extremely disappointed in you. Yep. I'm extremely disappointed. It's not how you should act. I, I think he got it from his dad. I think his dad did something similar. But it, it just feels like something a dictator would do. Yeah, it, it is. It feels he like something. A a yeah. dictator would do. And it's like, look, dude, if you want to sit in on a meeting, get off your ass and walk in the meeting and say, excuse me, you won't notice me. I'll be in the back. I just want, I'm not undercutting his authority. I just want to watch. But that's how you do it, dude. You don't just like, no, he's wrong. Like, like imagine if you're in a class and it's, it's college and you have some supervisor teacher who just starts yelling over a, a loudspeaker. Nope, that's wrong. That's not how we're going to do it. It's like, well, why don't you just get in here and teach the class then? Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, f I, I want you to know for Lowell, uh, the big news uh, f from the last few weeks was not what happened at the owners meetings. The, 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 the new rules for kickoffs and the, and the tackling and, all, the, I, you know, I don't even know what they are. I'll learn them. It was what this gentleman told me off the, off the cuff. Hey, what do you think about what Kyle's doing? And I, I didn't even know. Um, to me, that was the big reveal for me of the last few weeks. And it, it I have to say, uh, sometimes I'm down on Kyle because he can't close. Ray Leonard, when he had a guy hurt, could close. He was a finisher. Kyle isn't a finisher. That's a professional criticism. He's not what I'm making now is not a professional no. criticism. It's a criticism of his character. And yeah. that's serious. Agreed. And Kyle, if I have it wrong, I apologize. If you would like to come on here and explain and show me that I'm wrong, I'm really open-minded and I, I'd be only too happy, too happy to listen. And to me, this is an example, a, another example of his worst quality, which is his controllingness. I agree. You got to let go. You are not a high school coach. These are professional athletes. You picked them. The coaches, too. Trust them. I got one more topic, a bonus topic. Bonus. The evolution of the 49ers defense. You ask John Lynch, Kyle Shanahan, well, why would you hire Brandon Staley? I mean, he doesn't really know the Niners' wide nine defense. And they keep saying, well, you know, you, you, you got to keep evolving. You always got to keep evolving. So it seems to me the Niners want to do something different this year on defense. And I think I've figured out a few things that they want to do differently after talking to people and really putting the, pick the pieces together. So one, for years, Kyle Shanahan, Kyle Shanahan sort of gives the directive of what he wants the defense to be. For years, it was, I want to rush four players and play zone defense and not give up big plays. That's what I want to do. Well, okay, they've been doing it for seven years and their pass rush stunk last year. They were 20th out of 32 teams in sack percentage. So I think... They bring in someone like Brandon Staley to be a little bit more sophisticated and exotic with blitzes because that's not something that Kyle really asked his previous defensive coordinators to do. That's a big one. Pressure schemes to improve the pass rush. So they, they signed a guy like Leonard Floyd who had been in a 3-4 defense, doesn't necessarily fit the defense, but he's the kind of guy that you could drop into coverage and do exotic stuff where you have him dropping and a guy coming from the other side. I think we're going to see stuff like that this year. Okay. The other thing, coverage. Think one of the things we saw last year, Joe Burrow, 
Kirk Cousins, few quarterbacks made it look really easy against the Niners. Like yeah. they knew where to go with the ball almost before the ball was snapped. And I think if you go back and watch the film, when the Niners would run a coverage, let's call it cover three, zone three deep, four underneath, they would show it immediately. So wherever they're lined up before the snap is what they were going to play. If they lined up before the snap in two deep man-to-man coverage, they played two deep man-to-man coverage. So when they went against good quarterbacks, they were just reading the Niners' mail. So I think what they're going to see is Brandon Staley, he doesn't know the wide nine, but he can sort of help the Niners disguise their coverages and disguise their pressure and be a little bit more straightforward, less straightforward. In the past, they were like, here's who we're rushing. Here's what we're covering. We're really good. Like, mm, you're getting beat. So I think they're going to try to just be a little bit more deceptive, which is probably smart. If that's what they brought him in for, then that was a very good hire. Yeah. Good for them. It yeah. shows that it shows. Here's what I want to say. It shows when it comes to defense, they're really always trying to get better. Right. They want to improve. They want to evolve. They don't yeah. want, they, they understand that you can't stay the same, but on offense, they're just they're a museum. They are. They're a museum. They're a wax museum. <laughs> anyway, Dark Mach- uh, Machoke says, my ex-employers did this. I confronted them and was let go a week later. I felt the same exact way that Papa Cone described. It feels horrible. Thank you, Dark. Aru Illustri says, we have the best defensive coordinator room in the end. <laughs> <laughs> That's, that made my day. <laughs> that was good. On that note, I think that's the end of the show. Uh, wonderful joke. Wonderful show. I'll be home tomorrow. Hopefully. I'm flying home. I got to change planes, which is always an adventure, but I'm not taking Frontier Airlines this time. No offense to Frontier Airlines, but I will never take them again. <laughs> I'm united. Hopefully I make it back in one piece. Uh, Dad, I love you. I love you. I'll talk to you. I'll, I'll see you tomorrow. I'll see you tomorrow. See you guys.